the leftist spear has long since been white with with white boys white boys uh white boys uh white boys white boys uh white boys uh white boys white boys white boys white boys white boys white boys Oh, oh, white girl. We, we love that. We love, we love, we love white girls. And two tokens. Two tokens. Two tokens. Which means that a lot of thoughts in these spaces are dictated by white opinions. Damn, is Left Tube written by Mindy Kaling? It's like a Tyler the Creator concert out here. The collective space of leftism we call Bread Tube is awesome and I and I love it, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong. I love bread as much as the next guy, but it's only the second best invention next to Racism. Yeah, yeah, racism. Yeah, yeah, racism. No racism. No racism. Actually, no. This is really, really bad. Re really bad for, for uh, black people and uh, marginalized groups. I like to think of the leftist space of the online cosmos as a separate universe with different galaxies in it. This universe is an echo chamber of progressive ideologies. Hey, hey, that's me. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. From Galaxy Cornbread catering to black individuals from the spear that I'm not allowed to say to the commentary community to the video essayist one the universe is composed of subsections of galaxies and along with every other universe in leftist existence bread tube is composed of echo chambers inside of the leftist echo chamber of progressive politics dictated by their respective creators meaning progressive politics and what's deemed as progressive might change depending on what creator you're listening to or what community you're a part of and to add to that although leftist youtubers may be in the same universes the way they do their content may be very different from the way they do their content and they might not even subscribe to this idea of universes some people just like making videos and vibing an example of this would be me and andrewism we're both in the cornbread galaxy look at us ha 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 look at look look at us cornbread galaxy inhabitants of, of cornbread galaxy. but andrew centers his work based on praxis plus he's basically a communist encyclopedia on planet andrew you will be co communified yeah planet andrew communified so solar we love that dude love that dude well on planet turd we tackle random subjects like how wednesday undermined depression how the boots on the green m m were actually a cover-up for a slavery lawsuit the kardashians k-pop but mostly just topics pertaining to anti-blackness although andrew and i are both leftists we cover vastly different topics and tackle subjects very differently there's no problem with that though two creators will ultimately do things very differently i know that was a wild big brain take that that's so big brained and i probably read so much theory to conjure up that idea but but say with me stay with me the underlying theme between leftist frames of thought that separate us from the Ben Shapiro's or even talking points in the toxic men defending Nazism spear is that we cover topics in dialects for the people that don't know what that means it'll be on the screen Dialect may thus be contrasted with both the heuristic, which refers to argument that claims to successfully dispute another's argument rather than searching for the truth, and the didactic method, wherein one side of the conversation teaches the other. Basically, when I talk about the destruction of black culture and how the vanilla villains did their bidding on the melanated masses, I am aware that there are underlying sociological and material issues in the black community which have caused a ripple effect of nuanced harm. There's intersections like differing black identities, differing social climates, differing material conditions, or perceptions of gender, which have caused very different experiences. For example, black people have been subjected to differing spheres of disenfranchisement. That's material conditions. If you're presenting woman, man, or NB, there will be differing connotations of gender. You will probably be expected to perform. That's perceptions of gender. When you're in closer proximity to whiteness, 99% of the time, there's less social scrutiny you go through. Those are social conditions. Do you ever feel like Michael Jackson benefited from white privilege? I just thought that was a funny joke because I said uh, Michael Jackson, he he, and Michael Jackson's uh, ca catchphrase is he he. He's, he's like a Pokemon, but his Pokemon entry is he he. I'm so happy I have you back. I'm 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 so happy I have you back. The nuanced talking points and relation to these experiences, however, cover a spectrum of takes that's beautiful to see. This is mainly why I love the leftist spear. New frames of thoughts, 
ideals, and critiques of white supremacist functionality are constantly being expanded upon by these phenomenal creators, which is refreshing as a black person to see. This experience isn't exclusive to the black community. I'm only using my own experiences as a reference point. In fact, the new age of nuance, I'm guessing is exciting for any marginalized group to see. Jesse Gender just hit 200K. Shout out to her. And so much creators are springing up, bringing new issues to life. Whether it be watching the trans community, although like the black community, still being heavily censored, flourishing in this new era of nuanced commentary, or watching the commentary community slash bread tube community start to incorporate marginalized groups in their videos. It's actually been a delight as a creator to experience and as a fan of leftist frames of thought, very heartwarming. But be it as it may, our discourse is dictated by our respective communities. And as much as we like to feign ignorance to the bigoted norms, with all the progress we've made in this short frame of marginalized renaissance, sometimes dialectical thought, specifically pertaining to the experiences we face, is still ruled by normative prejudice belief because our voices are still very small in comparison to the white norm. Meaning sadly, discrimination may still be on full display. We could see this on the white side of the universe. One could also refer to this area as the pasty parliament, the Milky Way, or Wisconsin. This area of pure Mayo madness is needed, okay? I'm not saying it's not, I'm not saying it's I not. mean, at the end of the day, we all perform for the same audiences, right? And they mostly steer leftists into more progressive trains of thought. They're good. I agree with mostly everything that goes on in these spheres of thoughts. Let's clap for the mostly non-bigoted white comrades. Yeah, good job, good job, man. Good, good. However, there's still some issues that I want to address, mainly with tokenism, spears of racism, platforming, and how these galaxies of leftism, although needed, can incorporate marginalized views or frames of thought, sometimes very, 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 very poorly. And this is what we're going to talk to, to today on today's episode of Pink Hair Man Make Video. Make video, make video, make video. Hey, this is KSI from the channel KSI. On on, on the channel K KSI from, from KSI, located at KSI. It's me guys, okay? That was just editing. Oh my god, how how'd you fall for that? You're so you're so silly. You're such a silly goose. You are silly, you're sillier than a goose. But my name is not KSI. You can see that because my my hairline is intact. Um hairline review in the in the comments, hairline review, zero out of ten. My name is Turb and welcome. Uh why am I wearing a halo? Tr trigger warning, uh, trigger warning, uh, tr trigger warning. Uh, I, I kind of got, uh, house robbed and there was a knife to my throat and, uh, I, I, I'm re-recording this video and I just decided to throw on a halo. That, that's that. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> if you didn't punch the ever living fuck out of some pasta to show the Italian government that you don't rock with fascism and that pizza is a spear of disenfranchisement, which needs to be hung upside down from a gas station. Go do that for me and send me a video. This is my Patreon if you wanna wanna support me. There's so many cool behind the scenes videos and you will help me pay rent and eat ice cream sandwiches. Link in bio, link on face, link in park, sneaky link. Oh, you dirty leftist you. Oh, you dirty leftist you. I'm trying a new form of media analysis. Let me know what you think. I hope you enjoy the video. Roll the scene. <laughs> da, 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 da. Act 1. Historical Spears of Influence in Bread Tube. Leftist for this video just means anything left of Bernie Sanders. Did the Wii music make you feel comfortable? Welcome to the commentary channel. I am your host, David Dobrik from daviddobrik.com. David Dobrik, uh, I, I, I'm gonna fight my friends, uh, maybe critically injure them, ha 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 ha, I fooled you, I fooled you again. It was just an edited version of him, you silly goose. How, how'd you fall for that? How, how'd you fall for that again? He's not a leftist. This video was in a high intensity vlog, specifically four minutes and 20 seconds long. And today I am not attempting murder on my friends, sadly. Sadly, that's not something that's gonna happen today. To fully grasp how these leftist spaces came to be, we gotta know the history. We have to understand that BreadTube as we know it only exists as an evolution in long form content because of algorithm ties to positive publicity. The evolution of long form politically driven social media or media commentary in a frame of progressive content is actually very new. This pretty man that you're seeing right here with such a pretty man, with, with such a pretty face, with a pretty man, with the flamingo, with, with angel, angel. <laughs> Is a result of years and years of progression. Before long form content, skits, Vine compilations, and gaming channels were the most popular thing on the platform. At least to a Gen Z or former Sky Does Minecraft stan like, like myself. Think Smosh, 
Why Sakoshi, Ryan Higa, Superwoman. Yeah, and by the way, Ryan, you're welcome. You know what you did with your name. He used to think he has he had the past or something. He used to think he had the past, basically. While the majority of their content was bigoted in almost every way possible, their comedy was a product of its time. The alt-right pipeline was still in full effect. The algorithm would suggest more Ben Shapiro than Lindsay Ellis. Matter of fact, I didn't know that there were early forms of leftist content creators like like maybe a H bomber guy, but these YouTubers in this era were very indicative of their problems surrounding activism at this time. It wasn't cool to be a pink haired neurodivergent minor. I'm 12 age reveal. No, I'm not 12. I'm 22. YouTubers at the end of the day are performing for a predominantly white audience, meaning I'm not the target audience in the slightest. They're not making videos thinking pink, pink hair, black man gonna love this one. Oh yeah. He gonna love this video about cops. Ryan Higa, Ryan Higa made a video about cops, which was very copaganda. And he wasn't thinking about me. That's the problem with him. But if they do think pink hair man gonna love this one when they post, thank you, thank you. Aww. So when we look at the social media landscape from five to two years ago, we can guess how badly this content has aged. Not exactly like Pharrell Williams, if I do say so myself. I mean, Frank literally had to drop his whole thing and turn into a music dude and call himself Joji because he was making videos like this. Like a young blood. Shut what up, young blood? Up. Shut the fuck up. Okay. So like we we can we can just deduce uh what was going on. We we could deduce that they knew they was they were wrong, right? <laughs> Their content revolved around the social normality of online politics at the time. And as bigoted as they are, I have empathy for certain POC creators who were minorities and trying to gain traction and a following in this algorithm because they had to perform a sort of minstrelsy. I'm gonna talk about this later in the video. I just won't talk about this now. It's gonna be later in the video. It's gonna be a whole section. A lot of these people like Superwoman and Ryan Higa, although they were evil and super bigoted, super bigoted, they were visible minorities trying to break out in a genre of content that was made for white creators. They also tackled conversations of racism while also perpetuating these same hierarchies of white supremacy. Ryan Higa video again, Ryan Higa video again, Ryan Higa video again. Well, I'm talking about the ones where I'm actually siding with the officers. There's people who try to make them look bad. You know, they egg them on, they disrespect them, they borderline harass them until the police officer gets so mad that he makes a mistake and they get it all on camera. Yo. Okay, I, I need you to calm down. Why sir. do I have to calm down? I'm but at the same time, they also actively thrived off the social landscape of bigotry and heteronormality that YouTube was catering towards. So it's complicated, but I've since compartmentalized that sphere of existence as a traumatizing needed first step of activism that I guess I can do now. In the immortal words of Fick, me sitting here and talking to you wouldn't be a thing without these first steps that minority creators took. I have so much more thoughts about tokism and, and, and leftism, but for now, let's zoom a little forward and talk about the establishment of bread to specifically. In the same way BreadTube started off as predominantly white nerds critiquing spears of disenfranchisement, social norms of white supremacy, using video games and viral videos as a muse, being outcasts, these men were radicalized. They were the first introspective haters that actively deconstructed spears of ostracization that they were being societally subjected to. Although to bigoted, misogynistic, and heteronormative extents, but I can't lie to myself and say that I didn't, as a young boy, feed into this edgy content of bigotry. I was a tokenized black person Unfortunately, iDubs and Filthy Frank were among some of the things that me and my friends enjoyed as preteens because of the edgelord trains of thoughts that reaffirmed my experiences, at least patriarchally. And this is very unhealthy and this is very unhealthy and we need safer avenues for people that are trying to reaffirm their experiences. That's the basis of this video. That's the basis of this video. That's the basis of this video. Don't watch iDubs to try to be a leftist. I mean, nowadays these people's content is rancid. Idub's content cops have aged terribly. Looking back on it, his little teardown of Tana Mogu perpetuating anti-blackness was actually backwards and pivotal in arming white bigots with a means to be racist unironically. The point is these spears affect us and our social landscape to drastic extents. No one is watching TV anymore like they used to. To quote FD again, this is the next form of informative content that you're getting that's not behind a streaming paywall. Therefore, disarming big Bigotry matters in the long run. Unpacking these spears of bigotry and adding diversity matters in the long run. When I want black youth to talk about the landscape of YouTube, I don't want them having ingrained trauma because some white guy was called a nerd for liking Star Wars a little bit too much and decided to quell their anger by delving into anti-black bigotry and rhetoric surrounding um, Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> what I'm saying is, this is how we make a better tomorrow 
for all marginalized groups. The commentary community, the commentary community, the commentary community, the commentary community, the commentary community. Let's start with picking on uh, picking on the commentary community. These dudes are my friends and they're awesome. So we'll start off on a, on a slightly better note. Commentary YouTube is an amazing place filled with amazing creators. I love this guy. He, he, he taught me a lot about how land landlords suck. I love this girl, she's British. She's, she's British. I'm just kidding, Tana. Your insightful content makes you at least, at, at least Canadian in my eyes. Nick, Ethan, Chad, Chad, Anna, etc. All very cool, very awesome, very based creators. However, other than Jarvis and Jordan, this space of YouTube is very devoid of melanin. I also want to say some of these creators are becoming more and more visually POC though. Actually, actually, um, uh, Ro is the only... Ro Ro's the only one if we're if we're really being honest. When I say white, I'm talking about the social construct and the privileges accompanying systems of priority to white appearing individuals. This doesn't mean that all of them are 100% white. It just means that most of these creators platformed in these spaces are in closer proximity to whiteness. That, that that's such that's such a coincidence, right? That, that that's such something that you y'all didn't see and I saw and, and 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 you you can't obviously see it when you go on their when you go on their channels and you go on who they collab with and you go, wow, now now that I said it, I, I bet you really see it. In 3D, 2020 vision, IMAX movies, um, the shaking chair thing, 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 quality, right? Yeah, 4D, four dimensional. <laughs> There's nuance though. Leftist spaces of commentary is a good thing. And having a white ally leftist representation is an even better thing. And if you don't think that's a great thing, then you're so right because two things can be true at once. Two things can be true at once. Dialectical conversations. Bro think he Karl Marx. But because the space for so long has been dominated by white leftists and, and still is, to be honest, unfortunately there's spears of racism present that we have to split apart. Similarly to when your partner is like, I want to procreate. And then you have to split apart their legs for, for cunnilingus time, for, cu for cunnilingus, cunnilingus time, cunnilingus, cunnilingus time. iPhone notification sound, iPhone notification sound, iPhone notification sound, iPhone, iPhone notification, I, iPhone, iPhone, iPhone. And maybe one Samsung notification because we're, we're not capitalists. Yeah, Samsung. Full disclosure, I'm going to this conversation with good faith. I'm of the belief and assuming that none of these creators in the debate sphere sense are silencing black frames of thought. I've met a lot of them and it's always been a pleasant experience. We played games on stream and it, it was it, it was fun. It was fun, man. It was fun. Ro, Anna, Noah, Duncan, Tara, all beat my ass. And also F the algorithm who I was just on like two days ago. Uh, they, they invited me too. Awesome people, awesome people. Although I wouldn't really say they're from the commentary community. But Still awesome people. And this was also a pretty first major step in diversity because this stream was one of the first times Cornbread Tube had a convergence point with white commentary tube. Thank you, Noah, and everyone present and the F the algorithm stream. You all y'all y'all all get stars. Y'all, y'all friend. I love y'all, man. Now when people think racism, they automatically think, hey, this is this is so bad and so evil and, and, and so bigoted and so so evil, so wrong. We shouldn't do that. That's that's evil. And they would be right historically, socially, and economically. You could say racism is canon in Western lore as as very bad um skill tree skill tree white supremacy, but we have to understand that racism in itself takes many forms. Just because these spaces aren't outright calling us the N-word doesn't mean they're not automatically devoid of any anti-blackness. And just because commentary tube has two black friends doesn't mean they don't participate in pedestaling tokenism and white representation as the norm. Disregarding blackness is very easy because Be because white, meaning things that I see and I'm bringing up, may be a little nitpicky to a lot of y'all. But, but, but hear me out, but hear me out. Let me cook, let me cook, let me, Am I cooking? And also a lot of these problems inflicted on black people are because of a lack of nuance. It's okay to not know what the black experience is like. I wouldn't really expect a lot of you guys to if, if we're being honest, but this lack of nuance ultimately creates anti-black ripple effects in the sp space time leftist continuum. And being a black inhabitant of this, of this, uh, this, this, this space, I kind of get sad when I see these statements uttered with a lack of nuance. But again, I'm going to go into this with good faith and expect that a lot of these racist occurrences happen because of the cracker genealogies and these people, I guess. They've never faced a lot of the problems that I'm voicing, or at least to the extent that 
I have. So there's bound to be some conflict on what we deem as representation and anti-blackness. Basically, I'm saying commentary channels are good for the left, but th this is what I got for y'all to think about. Started that weird as hell. Originally, this piece was gonna be a dissection about a rap video that Nick Is Not Green made in comparison to FD signifiers. But I've just kind of now realized that that really gets us nowhere. I could give you numerous amounts of microaggressions and anti black frames of thoughts in this video. But at the end of the day, what does that accomplish? This isn't the most revolutionary form of praxis. More so I'd equate it to education from a queer presenting black individual. All of these isms of anti-blackness pertaining to rap are products of disenfranchisement causing disconnected experiences. So from my point of view, calling it out won't stop it, no. But there are problems we can actively address in our own community in correlation with digital minstrelsy. It seems as if black people in the content creation space are only viable when we're a topic and used as leftism brownie points, but more so the latter, when we're used as instruments of content. The first one is very nuanced and I'm not gonna hate on creators for pushing the BLM agenda. It's an amazing thing to see white allies rally for the black cause, but the practices in these spaces surrounding platforming still pushes ideals of white supremacy. Specifically speaking, YouTube circles are a lot like clicks. Everyone that went to the streamies were all a part of a small circle of white dudes other than Nick that bounce collabs off of each other. I mean, it's very clear what type of acceptable commentary is accounted for on the YouTube space. And it's very clear what most of these clicks push, whether it's a product of friendlier content internalized in the algorithm's minds or theirs. And this friendlier content just isn't black. Again, I, I love what y'all did for Jarvis and Jordan, but at a collaborational level, that's really the extent of platforming that a lot of these spaces do. Whereas in the video essays community, it's diverse, the experiences, sexuality, gender presentation, and nuance. While commentary is just catered to cut and dried takes of pretty liberal stances, which is why it's so easily catered to the white men who dominate these spaces. I'm just asking you guys to question, why is there so much content creators that circle their content around black culture, but somehow leave or exclude members of the experience in favorability for surface level content creators who just have more clout? And I get that YouTube is a game of clout. Everyone's trying to feed themselves while simultaneously performing for a predominantly white audience at the end of the day. And this audience doesn't really care if it gets its rap analogies from a white or a black person. As as long as it's entertaining. So this is very much an audience problem too. But when are we gonna take a reflective look into these spaces and realize that dunking on black people seems to be more important than including black voices. And I don't mean only in your slavery videos. I mean including black voices, whatever the genre. And I know there's a lot of black voices not wanting to intermingle with the commentary community because of the lack of diversity and limited nuance we've seen from an outsider's perspective. So we might have to rebuild a lot of these connections of the online left if we wanna see a shift from this white hegemonic power structure that's present in the modern day. But that starts with y'all. <laughs> Y'all have the power and have been using it to provide limited or no avenues for black voices. It's not hard to hit up a black content creator and ask them to do a little collaboration or a little reading in a video. We all know how overshadowed black people are in the algorithm. That collab could make or break a lot of our careers. Let me tell you my story of content creation, okay? So pre YouTube, I basically got banned a million times on TikTok and then I was struggling on YouTube for a while, just making these 10 minute videos until FD found me from some Twitter post. I'm gonna put it up there and shouted me out showed me a whole other world this whole community of just black creators who are amazing i don't think fd really knew this but i'm severely disenfranchised and before then i was even more so youtube's provided me with a job that's actively changing mine and people around me's life that one community tab shout out was so powerful it literally lifted me above the poverty line. Shoutouts and platforming can change lives on individual levels. And yes, my experience was pretty extreme because I am a disenfranchised black person. But now I've gained a platform directly because people like FD Signify, Fab Socialism, Shan Spear, Professor Flowers, Noah Sampson, Ro Ramden, Think Peace, Lonnie, Color Mind J, Lil Bill, Bellamy, Aranok, The Leftist Cooks, F The Algorithm, etc. This, this whole community has just welcomed me and in. now I could use my platform that I've curated here to shout out other people too who are marginalized and might have their voices restricted by the same algorithm that suppressed me for so long. Community tab shoutouts are a very underrated tool. Use them. Use your community tab shoutouts, please. So even if you can't or don't want to collab with a lot of these upcoming creators, a shoutout can really suffice. And it only takes about 10 seconds. Rather, I guess you, you watch the video first, so like 10, 10 seconds on, on top of the video. Now, when I talk about black people being used as instruments, I mean, y'all dunk on us 
more than you support us. And that's just a fact. There's more diversity in the black people that you're dunking on than the black people you're working with. And that's an issue. I wouldn't correlate this to tactics used in the debate sphere where white streamers just openly use other black leftists they don't agree with as content farms and then tokenized shark. But nevertheless, it's still anti-black just in an I'm not touching you kind of way. So as much good as these spaces are doing, moving liberal viewers further left and providing enjoyable ass content, y'all are still racist for doing that. And it's actually kind of hard to call out racist practices in these spheres because I'm actively a part of them. At this point, this channel decides whether I can or not pay rent. I'm a pretty full-time YouTuber right now. So tarnishing connections this early kind of sucks, but man, y'all need to stop dunking on us and start trying to build connections with the black community that you actively have have around you. I also get how I'll go viable the dunk is. Everyone loves a good dunk. I made one of my dunking videos in the past on Fresh and Fit, the same dudes that y'all were dunking on all summer too. But maybe ask yourself why. You're so much more quicker to make a video dunking on a black person than centering a black voice or centering a black experience. Is it because of the algorithm? Is it because of the rabbit audience at YouTube who just wants to see blood at the end of the day? Or is it because the only black culture and experiences your most comfortable voicing is from your own mouths, white mouths. I get that it is uncomfortable adding black nuance, but we have to try to be more comfortable with uncomfortability. Y'all have to start talking to us. When are you gonna give us platforms to speak about our experiences too? Act two, dividing of the internet. Between the constant ban of major black creators on TikTok, silencing of activist voices, and plausibility of content leading towards blue-haired SJW gets owned by androgynous 40-year-old male who can't even get his wife wet, we can kind of theorize that a certain agenda is being pushed. White comfortability. Well, actually, let's be honest. Being black, a notable POC, or a trans activist with a platform is a statement in itself. Meaning even if you aren't part of the leftist universe, you can still be censored, belittled by the algorithm, and ultimately face tokenism in these spaces. A lot of these voices don't even have to be activist voices, and most of these videos being censored aren't progressive videos. It's more like being POC is deemed as progressive enough of a reason to warrant backlash both from the community and from the algorithm. Through this mindset, a logistical thought pertaining to the nigh apartheid-esque mentality Mentality that the algorithms have put out and we've internalized, we can deduce with full certainty that these algorithms are the type of cookie connoisseurs to separate the white part of the Oreo from the black part of the Oreo. In fact, I heard on Shade Room that platforms have a thing against dark mode. I mean, it took 13 years to fully integrate this function onto the YouTube platform, so I'm inclined to think our first lady, Miss Reagan, was probably stalling judicial policy in order to destabilize black communal thought. My sources, being the three foot tall dude named Hornswoggle, who only jumps out of my desk to scream words, have deduced that the IDUB supporters brought into these communities have done equivocally the same amount of damage in black communities as 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 cocaine so this is a fair analysis okay this is this is a fair comparison reagan algorithm maybe maybe it's just this it's the same thing different day same thing different day the point is platform racism and division is a real thing and as much as these algorithms and creators like to go i don't see color guess what that doesn't change the fact that our communities are still actively being silenced that doesn't change the fact that we're targeted for being marginalized. That doesn't change the fact that my time zone is intrinsically different from yours. And if you want me to show up on time or, or even show up as a fact of the matter, you have to invite me five months prior or else I'm going to sleep in because I it's black time. You, yeah, you wouldn't get it. I'm just a misunderstood insomniac. If you're not going to take it from me, take it from Corey Kenshin. One of YouTube's nigh Mount Rushmoreian figures of fame, whereas white creators like PewDiePie can constantly spew bigotry and get away scot-free. Corey Kenshin, a black person who's in the same niche as these chalk sock creators, needs to be so conscious of protocols regarding age in his videos that he not only censors every single swear word he says himself, but also swear words that he plays in video games. I like making y'all suckers think I actually cuss. That's, that's, that's insane. It's insane how he's still being taken down. I mean, have you ever even really heard of a controversy revolving around this guy? He's like the yin to Azalea Banks's yang. However, he still finds himself having repeated strikes over YouTubers in his same niche. That just happened to be born under the connotation of snow succubi. It doesn't stop here though. To differing degrees, no matter how much of a safe space you perceivably think they are, all areas of the internet have discriminatory means for marginalized peoples. Most of the time, this isn't really the fault of the Caucasians inhabiting these 
spaces, mind you, although they do aid to the problem. I mean, the video essays community has only very recently become more black oriented and incorporating more marginalized trains of thoughts. I'd relate this to the age old story of whitewashing media. When we put vaguely progressive, normalized views on a pedestal, we eliminate minority voices who might have more of a say or insight into the said topics at hand. This could be seen through the f debate where he got away with calling Professor Flowers a black supremacist, or the c controversy where she got away with attacking black trans activists, the current Kanye situation, or the multiple microaggressions that are internalized into the minds of these watchers who consume these types of contents under the guise of left progressivism only to be spoon-fed bigoted beliefs again and again. But how do we counter parasocialism which causes the masses to side with these leftist creators who've been inflated into being beacons of progressive hope? How do we combat racist representation which is curated to benefit white creators? I mean as black people don't we all have to fit a sort of mold in order to even be seen? Isn't the act of having a platform and performing for a predominantly white audience to differing extents acts of minstrelsy in itself? Well you came to the right place cause like Bill Nye in a grade 3 science classroom doing photosynthesis on the smart board, I have the answers. Turb nice these activist guy. Turb, 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 turb. You know, being black isn't enough if you're not constantly making self-degrading jokes. So I needed a gimmick, uh, pink hair, and I'm I'm Turb the activist guy. So now you can show me in grade three classrooms all across America. You're welcome. I'll be shouting cracker at your children in all junior high schools near you. YouTube for black people is like marrying into a family of zeros and ones. Then having your stepbrother be a line of binary code. Then once in a while being trapped in a drawing machine and inevitably being, being, um, uh, if, if you know, you know, if you know, you know, multiple times. And they don't even pat our heads and call us good girls. They don't. Well, actually media marketing, platforming, and influencing in general is a very rigorous job to take on. Whether it's on TikTok, YouTube, or Twitch, there's a certain level of luck, skill, and talent you have to hit or inherently have. Whether it's being extremely gorgeous, marketable, or controversial enough to drum up the right kind of conversations. It's the internet's undisclosed holy trinity, and I'm the father, son, and the holy spirit. Or maybe even Mary Magdalene, because I'm a little freak and I need saving. But marketability, like my fits, is a very androgynous concept, which actually only works to uplift black creators who embody characters that appease the algorithm. Meaning platforming on the Richard scale is already like a 10, but like if you're black, now it's like a 20, and now the Richard scale is broken because that shit harder than diamonds. If there ever was a make a YouTuber game, the difficulty would be set with your skin tone. I'm sure you've watched Corey Tension's videos calling biases out, and maybe some other white dudes who also talked about this problem, but skimmed over racism and said, uh, it was racist, but uh, it, it happened to me too completely subverting the message in Corey Kenshin's video and actually aiding to the racist problem at hand by feigning ignorance and providing counter reasons for why he was getting banned, thus negating the original said conversation that algorithms are inherently racist. At least you tried, septic eye, I, septic eye, I, dude. Yeah, I've tried meant pushing Corey Kenshin's grievances with platform racism under the rug, essentially overruling the initial point that algorithms see black content differently to voice their own superficial issues with the platform. Then yeah, you, you could say they tried, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't say they tried. Anyways, there's certain ways as a black person that you have to act in online spaces in order to be pushed by certain algorithms, pushed by peers, or even interacted with. I mean, when you have YouTube commentary channels making more videos opposing black creators than supporting, you you kind of see what's going on here. Just look at any commentary channels, community tab, and uh, it's apartheid. It's apartheid. It's, a, it's modern day apartheid. And we need Nelson Mandela, and I am he. Did I just compare myself to Nelson Mandela? I'm not Nelson Mandela, I'm terrible. But anyways, there's more to supporting the black community than just dunking on black people. I mean, have you ever been to a basketball court in the projects? Trust me, I live here. We have enough black on black, Vince Carter-esque dunking violence happening in our own communities, okay? We don't need a uh, Jason Kidd lobbing it up to Blake Griffin 360 windmilling on some random black dude, okay? We already do that enough, okay? <laughs> when you have YouTubers like FD Signifier, pinnacles of healthy black male expression, who are so aware of what a statement it is to be black and popular, 
that they literally consciously take out black from the titles of their own YouTube videos in order to appease the YouTube algorithm and the censor system just to earn a living from their videos, then you, you kind of see what's going on here, right? But this isn't just a us YouTube problem. Almost every black creator who voices their own grievances about racism, either on the platform and, or in the real world, like Lip Gloss who frequently talks about the social perils of being black and a woman, either constantly get banned or get the most amount of backlash from the white majority. If you're watching this lip gloss, I love you on TikTok, by the way. I love you on TikTok, queen. We're awaiting your return. I hope you have a nice hiatus. And when you come back, we will stand you. This is a lip gloss stand channel. Well, algorithms champion creators like King Bach, who essentially make jokes at the expense of black people while acting as a Jim Crow-esque figure for white people to point at and laugh, then you, you kind of see what's going on here. And on Twitch, when you have the top 100 streamers being white, except the one token black dude who just refuses to talk about politics, then you kind of see what's going on here. What I'm saying is, in essence, in order to thrive, everyone has to embody to some type of digital minstrelsy. Minstrelsy has become synonymous with black fame, especially in the comedic sense. Because in order to thrive in these algorithms, you have to appease the white majority first to differing extents. Psst. I'm using minstrelsy as a metaphor to encompass the changes of character, humor, and mannerisms that black people have to go through in order to appease the white majority. Remember this silly little term that I came up with isn't necessarily negative. More so the social fabric that allowed this term to be applicable to it is negative. Now, do I like my job? Yes, yeah, I, I love my job, man. I love my job. It's so awesome. Typing words on a screen for money, performing, uh, putting on angel earrings, just looking at the camera and talking. I love this shit, man. It's cool. It's, it's awesome. Actually, I think being a YouTuber is one of the most coveted positions in the world, so I'm very much in a privileged position. As a kid, I loved Lemony Snicket, specifically his mysterious alert. In a series of unfortunate events, one of my favorite book series ever, he wrote himself as an author, narrator, and a character who you never knew and was constantly theorizing about. How he wrote his novels in such a distinctly sarcastic tone is frankly nothing like my writing style because because I don't dick write. Okay, it might be a little bit like my writing style, okay, I might, I might have jacked him a little bit. But hey, little me reading those books wanted to be just like him. Flamboyant, half naked, and chilling with, with um, an angel thingy on my head. That's, that's what I pictured when I was six and wanted to be an author. However, as much as I love my job, I have my grievances with the caricature that YouTube and other algorithmic apps tend to inflict on my pigmented peers' personas. Today, we're going to be the Little Mermaid, hopping into the wonderland of white fragility and conformity, and discovering how skin color, in accordance with the wrong message, could plummet our reviews in adherence with the white gaze and sink our platform. Because after all, on YouTube, aren't we all just entertainers? And as entertainers, our biggest priority will always be the majority population, white people. So what happens when we rebel against the norm? Is appealing to the norm always necessarily minstrelsy? Will our peers ever practice intersectionality and actually help black people rather than just performing this pseudo liberalism that sets us back? Will Goku ever stop throwing on Party City wigs and calling them transformations? Find out next time on Turbs next section of the video. Have you ever known what it's like to hate your own reflection? Not because of superficial factors like a couple bumps of acne around your nose. Not because your adult teeth grew in a little weird. Now you kind of look like counter anamorph Bugs Bunny. Not because your left eye is identical to your mom's while your right eye is akin to your dad's, which both actually look kind of fine separately. But when you stare at them too long, they kind of look like a third grader trying to draw Tim Burton's character from memory. I'm talking about hating yourself so much that you intentionally start to separate from everything that is you and fitting a mold of acceptability. And although Eurocentric beauty standards are a valid reason to have grievances with your physical sense of a lot of us have suffered through discrimination under these perceived beauty standards so radical that hating yourself for these reasons seems like a luxury or a privilege. Have you ever hated yourself because your skin was too dark and every time you go out to play with the elementary kids they'd make snarky remarks like, do you roll around in the mud all day? You kind of look like a gorilla. You're the blackest thing I've ever seen. All the while slowly over time the comments deviate your perception of self to a point where you don't even like looking in a mirror. I mean as a six year old kid you never really felt different. You actually felt pretty awesome. You're academically gifted. You have a quick wit. All that's missing from the Kloss battle your package is the stroke. By the way, Turb fans, please do not attack anyone in this video being talked about. We do not foster mob violence. This video is meant to serve as a think piece into the current white normative spaces on YouTube, how they can be improved on, and what flaws they have, specifically delving into how a lack of diversity in these spaces affects creators, viewers, and audiences outside and in the realms of white normativity. 
I will not debate with you, but I will have healthy conversations. Enjoy the rest of the video. It's important to know what this compartmentalization itself means as a black person in order to fully digest the subject matter that I'm going to go into. This is specifically for my Coco Devoy comrades. In the immortal words of Oliver, crackers to the front. Now we all know there's a silly little social construct that exists in our social climate called racism, right? WRONG! It's not a silly boy, okay? It's a very serious boy that intrinsically intertwines with your character and changes your perception of self. Whether it be through beauty standards, actions, emotions, or personality. This essentially means that racism, specifically being acceptable perceptions of blackness, seep into both the viewer and content creator's minds, which creates a myriad of problems that need to be addressed on their own. Racism and patriarchy is in comparison to the norm, meaning the closer you are to the hegemonic model of a white male, the more privilege you will have. Yes, you can have prejudice against white people, and white women very much still suffer to differing degrees from patriarchal standards, but whiteness is the social default of acceptability. It's impossible to be systemically racist to a white person. Remember when Hassan got banned for saying cracker? Then everyone hopped on videos and said, Hey, that, that's not a swear. Hey, that's not a swear. Hey, hey, cracker not institutionalized. There's no systemic insinuations under prejudice dictated towards white people. So even if you don't agree with me, your favorite YouTuber does. Hassan said it too. Clip cracker. This is not a controversial take. It's like if you were in Vegas and, and for the sake of this practice, you're, you're 21 years old. Okay. Hopefully, most of my audience. And you're doing what Vegas people do, you know? Uh, developing a stutter via the cart you just bought directly from a guy standing in the alleyway with a brown trench coat containing 30 different pockets of malicious items you would only find in a Khajiit caravan. Then discovering you have photosensitive epilepsy. I can't say that word. Because for some reason, one million Visco girls ring lights decided to do a fusion dance in front of a casino and then plaster them on top of a billboard to read McDonald's. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. astigmatism i can't say epilepsy but i can say that then walking into the said casino and trying to pay your way into a jack black game using only monopoly cash because your mom told you that gambling was a sin and jesus would be sad if you used real money <laughs> you know they say whatever happens in vegas gets turned into a kevin hart movie where he's trying to convince the bachelor best friend to cheat or 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 uh, or i don't know I'm a broke immigrant. The closest I've ever been to Vegas was when I was recovering from a breakup and I was watching uh, Think Like a Man. Vegas, baby. In the same way white oppression has no proximity to black oppression, Monopoly money is also not in any real proximity to real cash. Don't believe me? Go, go to a bank and try to cash in those colorful little boys. Spoiler alert, the banks will call the cops on you for counterfeit probably. Meaning, the validity of real money is backed by the power system of the bank. The same way the validity of whiteness is backed by power systems of patriarchy and white supremacy. Don't believe me? Try to be black and tell a police officer so you're reaching for your license they'll be like turb this is a mcdonald's play place you're six five and running through the tunnels like a manic hamster and then you'll be like okay officer then bam you're dead and one person on twitter will quote retweet your death with the caption saying he should have complied and then another person will be like dude at a Chuck E. Cheese place. Yeah, trust me, you don't want to start a racial Twitter war with McDonald's as uh, the place of your death. The perils of being black in America, um, America, 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 America. But it's important to remember that if you're outside of the norm, being hegemonic white masculinity, you're subjected to different modes of inherent structural biases, which in turn hinder your perceptions of self. Everyone internalizes the feeling of being marginalized differently. Whether it makes you hate yourself, socially adjust to spaces around you by intrinsically changing who you are, or taking on tokenized traits, all of which are extremely valid under survivability. I did a lot of these things too, under the realms of racial survivability. And when I'm in white spaces, I still feel the inherent need to comply to some type of model minority of blackness. Like when I'm with my friends and I nod in agreement and I pretend to know who Pink Floyd is. Or or whenever they talk about the Beatles and I'm like, yeah, the beat. For the white people that don't get this, I'm gonna bring up the example of South Park. And if you don't know what this is, uh, don't, don't watch it. I'm not recommending it. None of what they say is in the Bible. Words to Proverbs, chapters three to five. And I'm the Lord. Yeah. L listen, listen to me. For as bigoted as they are, the white people in this show are the only people who have individualized traits outside of race. 
Eastern Asian people, indigenous people, and black people are used as cultural agglomations of stereotypes. Specifically speaking to the melanated experience, black people are commonly used as gangster representation punching bags. Except Token, a black person whose personality directly embodies survivability under the white gaze, by accepting the bigotry around him quietly and without contempt, and utilizing his tokenized traits of perceivable, upper-class politeness in white spaces. Remember though, he only acts this way because of survivability under extreme bigotry, okay? As the same with racism, everything around this show revolves as white people as the norm, and all other cultures just get clowned for endorsing in their cultures, basically. That's basically what goes on in South Park. As the same to differing extents on YouTube. And don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong, I'm proud of being black, I love the leftist space, cool space, awesome, awesome people, yeah. In fact, I refer to myself with the hard ER to be frank, not the A. Put some respect on my fucking name. In fact, I'm so much of a nigger that when I get heartbroken, I lift a 20 pound boombox in front of my girl's house. Play Confessions Part 2 by Usher and dance like a 2000s era Chris Brown until my light skinned love interest comes out of the balcony and asks me if I took my meds. <laughs> but there is a real pressure around fitting acceptable molds of blackness in order to thrive or even survive in white spaces. Meaning sometimes the only way to be seen as more than just the color of your skin or an algamation of your culture is to perform, to be something of a spectacle, to be a minstrel. Roll the definition. Minstrelsy was an American form of racist theatrical entertainment developed in the early 19th century. Each show consisted of comic skits, variety acts, dancing, and music performances that depicted people specifically of African descent. Yes, minstrels used to be white, but for the sake of this video, we're going to be applying this definition to a more modern day implication. Minstrelsy has evolved into an act of black performance meant to appease white people, not in theater, but on the screen. The most relative example I could think of pertaining to the embodiment of black minstrelsy is a little Twitch streamer called uh, Speed. You know, World Cup, World Cup, World Cup. Now this is a very nuanced conversation. Okay! And for the sake of this video, I'm just using speed to prove a point. I'm not really gonna bash a 16 year old for his actions, man. That's just not something I'm gonna do. Some of his actions have been extremely bigoted, not gonna lie, both to black people, Asian people, not white people because that's not how racism works but i'm not gonna bash an up-and-coming 16 year old for his actions i think he'll grow eventually in the realms of survivability i frankly really don't care how another black person decides to maneuver in their niche unless they're outright bigots unless their whole platform is surrounded by bigotry like fresh and fit or or unless you're drake or king bach y'all parted light skins and dark skins like moses did the red sea bible verse numbers 16 to 46. Okay, back to the topic. Speed is our said case of digital minstrelsy at hand. This can best be explained by his meteoric rise to fame. When he first started off on Twitch, he was as regular as any other 2K streamer. The need to stand out drove him to adopt the more eccentric traits you see in his viral video clips nowadays. But for the sake of this argument, let's just say he didn't adopt these traits and he was always this caricature of entertainment we see him embody on an eye week to week viral basis. Then it's important to note that it's only when his outlandish personality and eccentric interactions combine with his antics and charm if you can even call it charm catapulted him to stardom meaning either way if his personality is actually this naturally aberrant or not the same personality along with the constant progression of his ludicrous actions are the reason why he has the platform he has today but also speed is a very extreme example of digital minstrelsy i'd like to say that his form of entertainment isn't directly rooted in anti-black trains of thoughts more so he just embodies the caricature and profits off of it. I'd instead say the social factors of black categorization in entertainment led to the creation of speed type figures. Not all minstrelsy is inherently anti-black. There's nuance. However, figures like King Back who use digital minstrelsy in a way that plays off black stereotypes and bigoted humor are anti-black. They're anti-black. King Bach, we we got beef. I'm gonna make a video about you. Another one. Yeah, the last one's on my Patreon. If you subscribe, link in bio, Patreon, do it, please. And I'd even go as far as to argue that digital minstrelsy is embodied by all black creators to a certain extent because of aspects of survivability and needing to appear to a white hegemonic norm. Okay, let's take three steps back. Slide to the left. One hop this town. Like I said, the whiteout wenches are the norm. 
Unpigmented people's trains of thoughts are the norm. Bleached behemoth humor is the norm. Basically on YouTube, white is the norm across all genres. Thus the norm will be intrinsically suited to be fit for the norm. Simple concept. Right foot, let's go. Because of white being an algorithmic and social norm, a white person doesn't have to change or isn't as monitored as heavily as a black person is. In Five Nights at Freddy's terms, the white people are cam 5 and the security guard is constantly camping camera 10 because that's where most animatronics are, right? Th there's no way that that camera fits. Can't wait to meet you. So join the animatronic family. We open real soon. Also, white people tend to platform white people more than POC creators. Don't believe me? Just look at look at a community tab. It's it's apartheid. It's apartheid. It's apartheid. It's digital apartheid. It's not actually apartheid. It's just very awful to see. I don't like it. But we'll get to that one later. Thus, they gain more leeway in the algorithm, resulting in more support, growing their following, and you, you, you get it, you get it. Don't get me wrong though, the children of the chalk still have superficial problems with the algorithm. Because even if we say the algorithm isn't racist, it still has its flaws. The point is, the vanilla dunkaroos don't have to deal with the implications of being black in an all-white space. Has this camera been like tilted the whole time. Black people as a whole are more heavily monitored by the algorithm as we're outside of the perceived norm, both in appearance and thought. Me sitting here being myself, a black person with a growing following and a consistent fan base is a statement outside of the norm in itself. Even me, if, if, if I wasn't an activist, just speaking, that's that's a black statement in itself. And yes, I am an activist that voices black talking points and concerns the same way your favorite white commentary channel probably does without the black part. However, what is the norm of a video essayist on YouTube? Yeah, that's 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 just not me. Although I love these video essayists, especially Noah Sampson, my favorite white himbo lover from infinity to infinity. I love you, Noah, man. I hope you know that. <laughs> You'll find there's very few actual activists who are able to make statements about black culture in their niche and gain traction in the algorithm. One example of this recently happened with my friend Ollie, where her video got age restricted for talking about anti-blackness in Asian communities. By the way, Ollie, you get 10 black tur points that shit went viral in the streets okay i i love that video watch it i'll throw in the description or something although recently there's been a huge renaissance in the marginalized video essay community that uplifts trans voices and black voices which i'll talk about in a future video eventually it still doesn't disregard from the fact that we're outside of the norm meaning going against hegemonically white modes of thought and applying a black lens to life experiences is a statement in the algorithm itself because of that you'll find that a lot of us have to water down subject matter of our topics censor ourselves tone police ourselves or perform in front of the camera in ways that will appease the algorithm. And I'm no stranger to this myself. For emerging black creators like me, who are trying to make YouTube a viable source of income, and for established creators who actually need this money to live off of, putting a middle finger up to the system, then dealing with the backlash of having your pockets hurt every video, or dealing with the backlash of your channel potentially falling off because your audience just doesn't want to hear that shit. We live in a society, guys. Capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, restriction, not good. Bad, 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 You know, I live in a very abusive household. My mom literally called the cops on me for editing YouTube videos. YouTube is just not something that black people do, especially in my black um culture. See, we we go be doctor, and I'm YouTuber with angel head. Not good. If I don't make enough money, uh, I'm gonna be homeless, and I'm dead ass right now. I'm moving out. I mean, a very good PG example of black trains of thoughts being policed can be seen with my dad, FD Signifier, and my good friend, Foreign Man from a Foreign Land. I know FD doesn't like when I bring up this reoccurring father, fatherless joke, but uh, I, I gotta throw it in at least once a video. What's he gonna do? Take me out of his community tab? What's he gonna do, FD? You, you love me, FD. Keep me on your community tab, please. I love you. <laughs> As we're speaking, he's figuring out how to replace me. <laughs> Jesus. Anyways, FD sprung up on a space of YouTube when it was wildly white. It's like in this video, if I was complaining about three feet of snow, this guy's been through a blizzard avalanche in the Swedish Alps, to say the least. The conundrum of performing for an all-white community also results in a lot of tokenism.
dissect it because I, I honestly get it. There's a lot of things we have yet to unpack in these spaces, but when we don't have these conversations, these situations will keep occurring. And I get the need to conform online. I was banned off TikTok about nine different times and I've recently had to restrict my speech more strictly in order to be algorithm friendly. Lest you don't see Turb in your notifications, that'd be a scary day for YouTube. We already know that it takes an average of a year for a content creator to hit 1K and for black content creators, considerably longer. Especially now since the YouTube genre of commentary and video essays is becoming so ethically and socially diverse, there's a need to integrate differing spheres of thought. This is no hate to those creators, but when we only platform the black creators who fit the same surface level commentary we see from these predominantly white leftists, then we fail ourselves in the long run. Diversity also means inclusion of thoughts, not just faces, okay? Jarvis and Jordan, as much as I critique their content, are needed in the long run. I will admit that. Growing up, I didn't really have a black creator who I really latched on to because these spaces were just so dominated by white creators. So to see two black creators doing so well kind of warms my heart. Good job, guys. Jarvis and Jordan specifically. I love y'all. But even if we contrast these issues and pat ourselves on the back for how much progress the video essay community has seemingly had, we just can't be satisfied with it. There's still anti-black rhetoric and platforming issues that we need to address, deal with, and come together as a community to fight against. The thing is with this current situation, situation is, it's still happening. This is a present problem that we can fix as a community. Platform black artists when you talk about black issues. Don't speak over our voices. And help us so we can help you. Help us so we can help the black people out there without a voice. Help us so we can build a better future for YouTube tomorrow, today. But that was just my rant. Feel free to take my advice or don't. I don't know, I'm just a pink hair video dude on the on the internet that makes these little little 30 minute videos because the university just wasn't a vibe, I guess. Tell me your thoughts and opinions, rant in the comments, or just say what's up. I'm posting three times a month now. I'm contractually obligated, so that's not a lie. I'm saying that for real. YouTube black. I'm on it. Sub to my Patreon if you like the vibes. It really helps me pay for my creators and my rent. Um, by the time this video is out, I'm probably already going to be moved out. This is the last video I'm recording in this house. So, um, sub to my Patreon. Um, I might post updates on, on the apartment and everything there, but like, just sub to my Patreon. You will help me so much, please. If you can. If you can. Obviously. If you can't, don't do it. Don't let my parasocial veil make you do things that you don't want to do, okay? See you next time, and peace. Awesome, we're done. Oh, also, thank you, Neil, for editing this specific video. Neil is the editor for this video um, from The Leftist Cooks, and they're an amazing person and an amazing artist. Neil. <laughs> okay, word, word. See you next time, and peace.